participate in the graduate program of uh, Mississippi School of Preaching from for the period 98 through 2000. Done local work in Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and been working with Fish Hatchery Road up in Huntsville, Texas for the past seven years. He also serves as one of the elders there. He's done mission work in the Philippines and Cambodia, hosts gospel meetings, speaks on several lectureships, and has conducted evangelistic campaigns in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, and worked with uh, several Bible youth camps. He served in the faculty of the Rose City Bible Learning Center in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he's married uh, to the former Sue Bemis, Bemis in 1978, and they have three children and 12 grandchildren. He's speaking to us uh, this afternoon. I've got to find him now. I've changed this thing up so many times. Uh, on the deity of Christ is Jesus of Nazareth, God. Let me speak to us, Bruce. I was going to say good afternoon, but it's morning, so I'll say good morning. Well, Lee Moses did a great job on the historicity of Jesus. We're going to now talk about the deity of Jesus. Uh, was Jesus of Nazareth God? And you know, Lee pointed out a, a very interesting thing, that this is the funny eldership here. But he didn't say how. Did he say, like, you're very funny guys. Or do you say these are some very funny guys? <laughs> you know, we just don't know. Did he mean funny haha -ha or funny strange? I don't know. I'll leave that up to those that know him best to be able to determine which is which. You know, we think about the deity of Christ and we're among Christians. You would think, well, duh, just say yes and sit down. But, uh, you know, our job is to go out and preach Christ and to be able to teach others that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh. And in fact, uh, that is our marching orders, to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. See that Mark 16, uh, 15 to 16, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and following. The obligation to go out and make disciples, disciples of Jesus Christ. And, you know, there are many disciples of many different uh, individuals but to be a, a disciple of Christ is really to say something about Christ. And when we make that good confession that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, I'm stating more than just the fact. I'm really acknowledging who and what Jesus really is and what my relationship then is to him as uh, a sinner to a Savior, a servant to the Lord, a citizen to the King, and certainly a subject to my creator and we need to keep in mind that Jesus is deity in all that we do. Uh, you would think that among Christians that we would have a strong confidence in our understanding of the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, literally God in the flesh, but you know many Christians that sit in the pew would willingly acknowledge that but they would really have a hard time to give a good defense of it. And uh, so it's one thing to acknowledge our understanding, our faith in Jesus Christ as the deity in the flesh, but it's another thing then to give a defense of that. And many Christians who have put their Lord on in baptism could not make a proper defense of the deity of Christ, and that is really a sad situation and commentary on the current situation in the Lord's church. And I say this simply because I know of a congregation up in, in Pottersville, Missouri, where certain members there would deny the deity of Christ, and they're accepted members in that congregation. And it is well known by other members that they do not believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. Now, friends and brethren, here's the thing. If you've been baptized and you do not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, then you're still in your sins. Because Jesus said, except you believe not that I am he, he said, if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. And friends and brethren, it is essential that we get a, an understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, literally God in the flesh. And if we do not believe that, then we are just as lost as Satan. 
Now, when we think about this thing, friends and brethren, we need to then prepare ourselves not only to defend the truth of, of the deity of Christ against infidels, but also among those in the Lord's church. And it's unfortunate that uh, that is the case. Whoever did the teaching and so-called conversion of those that deny the deity of Christ failed miserably in their assignment to convert those people to Jesus the Christ. And so what we want to do at this time is we want to present some evidence from the scriptures that would teach that Jesus is deity, that he is God in the flesh. We have in the book, um, I believe, eight examples of some some uh, reasons to accept and believe that Jesus is the Christ. And we're going to try our best to get through all of those. And then at the end, I want to come back and make some applications some, and, and talk about some things that uh, I think need to be said at this time regarding some people's faith in Jesus Christ or, or maybe I should say lack of it. And, you know, when we think about somebody's lack of faith in Jesus Christ, Someone doesn't necessarily have to get up and just say, I, I deny that Jesus is deity, but they can sure live like they believe that. You know, such a thing called practical atheism. Some people that believe that there is a God, but they live their life as if he did not exist. And there are those in the Lord's church today who would acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, but they live their life in such a way as to give evidence that they really do not believe that. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit later on in our lesson. But let's get to the heart of the matter. The first thing we want to talk about is that Jesus has the, the right to take upon himself names that are attributed to God. Now, if Jesus is able, and rightly so, to take upon himself names that are reserved in Scripture to refer only to God, then that implies something, doesn't it? That implies that he is either being blasphemous or that he is God. And, you know, keep in mind as we make these applications through this lesson upon two occasions, once it is baptism and once it is transfiguration, the God in heaven, our heavenly Father, said what? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus has the stamp of approval upon him from the very God of heaven. And so whatever he does and whatever he assumes, to take upon himself as deity, he has God's approval. And so we can't question it when Jesus takes these names or these attributes or these characteristics that we're going to study later and then say, well, you know, he really didn't have a right to do that. Well, God gave his approval to Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And so we have that uh, testimony from God the Father to give support to those things that Jesus did. John stated in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17, the first thing we're going to talk about under this heading of, of names attributed to Jesus prove that he is God, we're going to look at the fact that he is the Alpha and the Omega. And in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, And when I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And so Jesus takes upon himself the, the title of the first and the last. But if we go back to Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6, that title is reserved for God only. Isaiah says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and besides me there is no God. And so that was a title reserved for God and God only, but yet Jesus takes it upon himself and uses it to apply him. What is Jesus doing but affirming his deity in making that statement? Furthermore, in the first chapter of Revelation, the Lord God declared that he is the Alpha and the Omega. John records his words in, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. He repeats this in Revelation 22, verses 12 and 13. Jesus then takes upon himself those names. What about the King or Lord of Glory? 
These also are names that are reserved for deity. But yet in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8, when Paul is speaking of the, refer, uh, the crucifixion, he refers to Jesus as the Lord of glory. And so here we have another example of a name that is reserved in the Old Testament, the Lord of glory, used in reference of Jehovah God, but still then applied to Jesus Christ. Notice Psalm 24, verses 8, and then again in verse 10. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now since this title is reserved in the Old Testament, for Jehovah, when Jesus takes upon it and uses it himself, or Paul, an inspired writer, applies this term to Jesus, what do we conclude? Again, that Jesus is God. Take, for instance, again, Thomas' statement in John 20, in verse 28, when he finally comes before the Lord and the Lord shows him the nail prints in his hand and invites him to put his hand in his side and the scar in his side. And what does Thomas say? In response to that evidence, he says, My Lord and my God. You know, the Unitarians would try to say, Well, he was just surprised to see Jesus, and that was used in, 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 as an exclamation of surprise. Well, if he did that, then what would be the result? Well, then he took the Lord's name in vain. But what does Jesus do? Jesus turns around, and in that same context, in verse 29, he gives Thomas a blessing. Blessed are you, because you've seen and believed. Blessed are they who have not seen yet believed. And so Jesus commends the statement of Thomas. You know, we always refer to, to Thomas as doubting Thomas. But you know what? When he saw the evidence, he reached the conclusion that was demanded by the evidence. My Lord, my God. You know, some of my brethren today can't take evidence and reach a conclusion. And that's unfortunate. Friends and brethren, when the evidence is presented that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he's God in the flesh, then we need to accept that and live our lives based on that fact. And we need to, we need to consider that evidence. Paul also tells us in Romans chapter 9 and verse 5, it says, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. And so Paul comes right out and says it. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, in this verse, Paul refers to Jesus as our great God and our Savior. What about the I am statements of Jesus? Let's look at one. In, 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 go back to Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, and, and when Moses is fixing to go back and, and uh, approach the children of Israel and, and Moses about being released from Egyptian bondage. He says, who shall I say has sent me? And God says, when you get there, just tell him, I am has sent you. No qualifiers to go with that. Just tell him, I am. And we're going to come back and, and look at what that means. The I am. It describes the eternal, self-existing unchanging nature of God. I am is also used uh, with no modifying words, substantives or absolutely. Now here's the thing. If somebody says, are you tired? And you respond, I am. Well, that's qualifying, isn't it? You're basically saying, I am tired. Or someone asks Jesus, are you a Jew? And Jesus could say, well, I am. Well, that's not the way it's being used here. It's used without any qualifiers, brethren. And that means that God is simply stating to Moses, you tell him that the existing one, the abiding one, the eternal one, has sent you. And that was his credentials. The creator has sent you, the, the eternal one. And, and then later on, when we come up here to John chapter 8 and verse 58, when Jesus is talking about his relationship to Abraham, he says before Abraham was, I am. Notice Jesus didn't say before Abraham was, I was, indicating that he's just been around longer than Abraham. Jesus says before Abraham was, I was already in existence. 
Jesus existed eternally just like the Father. We think about this word I am in the Greek. It comes from the, the Greek ego I me. And uh, again, in this context, has no substantives, absolute or, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, it has no modifiers, whether substantive or absolute. And just as in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, there's no preg predicative nominative, which would, again, give some other basis for this statement. Jesus is then basically saying, before Abraham was, before he was born, before he lived, before he died, I existed. Again, he's really just simply talking about his state of being. Now we think about these things where, where Jesus takes these names and these titles and, and that are references to Jesus, I mean to Jehovah, to God, and then he applies them to himself. We are left with the only conclusion that he is really asserting his deity. He's laying claim to deity. Now when we, we could stop right here. And if we just accept Jesus' word for it and his claims to deity, we could be finished. We would be done and we could go eat lunch early. But you're not going to get out that easy, okay? Remember, we said we have eight reasons for believing the deity of Christ. Let's go on to the next one. Some of these are, are brief. Uh, some of them are longer. And some of them we may skip because I want to get to one in particular that's down the list. The second reason to believe that uh, Jesus is deity is that divine attributes are attributed to Jesus prove that he is God. We now will consider five distinctly divine attributes that are described to Jesus Christ. Since Jesus possesses these attributes, then again, we must conclude what? That he is deity. And for this cause, the Bible can say that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him. These are attributes or characteristics that are distinctly divine. In other words, mortal man cannot possess these attributes. A finite being cannot possess these attributes. Well, the first one we want to look at is the fact of omnipotence. The idea that God is all-powerful. And this attribute is ascribed to Jesus Christ. Through the Gospels, we are taught that Jesus had the power to create and sustain the universe. John speaks of that in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Not only that, but Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, says that he sustains us by the word of his power. Now, friends and brethren, unless Jesus has all power, he would not have the ability to create the universe and sustain it. Those are things that are attributed to God. Power over disease and death, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 14, John chapter 11, verses 38 through 44. Power over the winds and the seas and the demons, Matthew 8, 26 and Matthew 18, or, or chapter 8 and verse 16. They were all in submission to the word and the will of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, friends and brethren, the only way he could have had those powers over all the elements, over life and death itself, over diseases, over the demons, over creation, was as if he possessed deity. And so here's one ability that he had. We're further taught in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 and 23, that he is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also the world to come. All of these examples demonstrate the deity of Christ. The second attribute, omniscience. Jesus is all-knowing. He, he knows everything that is the object of knowledge. Again, this is ascribed to him. In John chapter 4, verses 16 and 19, Jesus knew the history of the woman at the well at Sychar. He knew that she had been married five times and was currently living in adultery. Jesus knew those things about her, and he had never seen her before. He knew the secret thoughts of men, Mark chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? 
Jesus was able to look into and know the hearts of men. Such knowledge belonged to Jesus or belonged to God alone. Notice 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 30. And also, if you're taking notes, make a reference to Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. But in 2 Chronicles 6, 30, it says, Then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and win unto every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou only knows the hearts of the children of men. But yet Jesus was able to look into the heart of man and know the heart of men. John 16 and verse 30. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needs not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou came forth from God. So these people that were able to witness these events, Jesus looking upon and knowing the hearts of men, re recognized what? his deity, and stated such. The third characteristic or attribute that Jesus has is omnipresence. He's, he's able to be everywhere at once. And that's hard for us to understand, but, but that's the, the characteristic of God. And Jesus also possessed that characteristic. Of himself, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. And also Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, and given the great commission, he told the apostles, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28 and verse 20. Furthermore, he sta it is stated of Jesus that he filleth all in all, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 23. These claims could be true only if Jesus was omnipresent. And if he's omnipresent, then he possesses a characteristic of deity. Fourth, Jesus existed in eternity, and this too is uh, ascribed to him. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, John says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so Jesus was there in the very beginning, at the start of creation, not as a created being, but as the Creator. And so Jesus is eternal. Jesus claimed, Verily, verily, I say unto you, again, before Abraham was, I am. This is a Jesus' own claim to being eternal in nature. John chapter 8 and verse 58. <laughs> the eternal nature of Jesus is spoken of prophetically in the Old Testament. Notice Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, speaking of the birthplace of the Messiah. It says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, thou that uh, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler of Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. And friends and brethren, we know that that's talking about Jesus. And his coming forth are from everlasting. And so, like God, Jesus is eternal. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The eternal nature of Jesus is demonstrated in that he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus is eternal? that he is our creator, that he knows everything about us? Isn't it wonderful that he possesses these attributes, that he's unchanging, that what he says today, he's going to keep his word tomorrow, and we don't have to worry about him going back on those things? Isn't it wonderful that Jesus possesses these attributes, and we can depend on him, and we can trust him, and put our hope and confidence in him, and know that he will never turn from us or forsake us or leave us without care and hope. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know that we have a Savior that possesses these, these characteristics of deity? Another thing we need to look at, that Jesus is immutable. And that's what I was just getting at. He's unchangeable. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. It says, They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they shall wax old as cloth and garment. And as a vesture shall they fold them up and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. You know, when we think about Christianity, we have a living Lord. We have a risen Savior. Jesus died, but eternal in nature, he was able to raise again. Where he sits at the right hand of the Father, ruling his kingdom, and he's promised to come back and what? 
take us to him if we're faithful to him. Now, friends and brethren, that's the kind of Lord and Savior we have. Not just a man. In fact, I wouldn't be a Christian if it was headed up just by just a man. It wouldn't be worth it. If Jesus is not the Christ, we might as well put this back on the shelf and go fishing. If Jesus is not God in the flesh, then we have no hope because only a man died on the cross. There's consequences, folks, if Jesus is not the Christ. All right. Let's go on. Next, next point. <clears throat> I'm going to pass on that. Uh, uh, divine abilities. I'm just going to go over these real quick. Divine, Jesus has divine abilities. He was able to do things that only God could do. Creation is, 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 is ascribed to him. Uh, Hebrews 1 and verse 10. John 1 and verse 3. He was able to forgive sin. The Jews understood that only God could forgive sin. And when Jesus said, take up thy bed and walk, thy sins are forgiven, what did the Jews want to do? <laughs> that's right. They said, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. Well, Jesus is God, and he had that right to forgive sins while he was on the earth. Uh, the future resurrection of the dead is ascribed to Jesus. Jesus is going to come back, and all that are in their graves shall hear his voice and come forth. And so Jesus has the power of the resurrection. He has the power to tra transform our bodies, uh, uh, is ascribed to him. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21. Judgment. Righteous judgment is ascribed to Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. So judge the quick and the dead, it is appearing in his kingdom. The right and the ability to bestow eternal life is repeatedly ascribed to Jesus Christ throughout the Gospels. My friends and brethren, again, that, uh, briefly stated, there's another reason to believe the deity of Christ. He has the ability to do the things that only are, are, are reserved for God to do. And so again, the reason given. Divine distinctions found in the Old Testament attributed to Jesus prove that he's God. Many statements in the Old Testament are uh, distinctly uh, of Jehovah God. Uh, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 11 and verse 20, But, O Lord of hosts, that judges righteously, that uh, tries the reins of the heart, let me see the vengeance of them, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. But yet, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 23, Jesus, it is said, that he is able to search the reins of the heart. And so again, these ideas, these distinctions that were reserved for Jehovah are given to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. You know, it has been said that, Je that Jehovah, the Father, is represented in the Old Testament and those things attributed to him that are taken and applied to Jesus in the New Testament. Therefore, Jesus is taking the place of Jehovah in the New Testament. And that's why these abilities are ascribed to him in the New Testament. But friends and brethren, we need to realize that Jesus was there in the Old Testament with Jehovah. And we need to realize that, that all those things that were going on in the, in the Old Testament... Jesus was right there as a member of the Godhead, pre-incarnate Christ, and he was involved in those things that transpired under the Old Testament. I want to get now to the sixth reason, and I want to uh, spend a little time on this. The divine essence. Jesus possesses the divine es essence, and this is taught in several passages in the New Testament and implied at least in the virgin birth, and if we get time, we'll, get, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Divine essence. Paul uh, commands Christians to have the mind of Christ in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. And then in verse 8, speaking of Jesus, he says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Notice, who being in the form of God, Jesus was in the form of God. Before the incarnation, he was in God's form. Now this idea represents the deity of Christ. He possessed the very essence. That's what that word form means. It means he possessed the very essence of God. 
whatever it takes to make God who he is, Jesus possessed that. He possessed that essence. Thus, there, there was and is absolutely no difference between the Father and the Son regarding their quality of being God. Who being in the form of God, not only does he talk about his essence, but it talks about what essence he was in. He was in the, he possessed the essence of God. The phrase being or existing in the form of God carries with it two facts of the antecedent, antecedent godhood of Christ previous to his incarnation and uh, continuance of his godhood at and after the event of his birth. In other words, he was in the form of God, but even though he took on the form of man, he still possessed that essence. Now, it goes on and talks about, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, or to be equal with God, a thing to be possessed, is really the idea, idea talked about there. In other words, being God or possessing the deity of God or the essence of God wasn't something that he could have taken upon himself. You either have it or you don't. Jesus didn't go out and steal it. He didn't go out and, and get some of it. He either had it or he didn't. In other words, Jesus innately and naturally possessed the essence of deity. The divine essence is taught in John chapter 1. Jesus, or John represents Jesus as the divine, eternal Son of God. This is the substance of, of John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. He starts out and says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later on he says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. At the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And so, friends and brethren, he possessed the characteristics of his Father. <coughs> Excuse me. J.J. Turner had this to say about John chapter 1, verse 1 through 18. He said, this describes the relationship between Jesus and the Father as eternal. He said it was in the beginning. It was personal. The Word was with God, and it was divine. The Word was God, and he has more to say about that. I'm just giving you his summation of it. Now, friends and brethren, when we think about this, this passage in, in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, John is very strongly affirming the eternal nature of, God, of Jesus and the deity of Jesus Christ. The divine essence of Jesus is taught in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Here Paul gives concise and clear statements in support of the deity of Jesus. He states, For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Fullness, we see, denotes fullness, that of which a thing is full. That's what Vine says. And so Jesus possesses the Godhead in the fullest measure that you can have. Now, again, speaking, what does it mean? He possesses the fullness of what? The Godhead bodily. Well, when Jesus was in the flesh, he was the full representation of God. We can't miss that point. And so, again, the idea of essence here. And, again, there's a long discussion of this in the book, but, in, in fact, we don't have time to continue that. The divine essence of Jesus as taught in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image. Look at, uh, we don't really need a commentary on these verses, do we? The express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sin, set down at the right hand of majesty on high. Friends and brethren, we come up to the virgin birth. I think uh, in his... In his book, Rex Turner uh, had a book, uh, I don't know why it went blank. Uh, boy, somebody help me. Systematic Theology. Systematic Theology. Thank you, sir. 
my wife that slipped my mind. He said that there's four what he called cardinal doctrines of Christianity. Number one is the virgin birth. Number two is the deity of Christ. Number three is the vicarious suffering of Jesus on the cross. And number four is the blood atonement. If you take out any one of those, you, you don't have Christianity anymore. And he's right on that. You take away the virgin birth, Jesus isn't God in the flesh. That's the only way for that to happen. And we go back all the way to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 when God promised Eve that through her seed one would arise up and crush or destroy the work of Satan. And so it was going to be through the seed of woman. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 where in the fullness of time God forth, sent forth his son born of woman, born under the law. Born of woman, that's talking about the virgin birth. You know, when we think about uh, the, the idea of procreation, and, and Brother Ross did an excellent job on his, his medical presentation of, of medical ethics. And, uh, you know, when he talked about that, that egg and the sperm from the mother and the father coming together and giving the genetic code for that child, well, we have the genetic code from Mary... That's half of the picture. And she would have certain characteristics of humanity, Jesus would. But what about the other half of that code? The other half of that code came from somewhere, and that came from God. And so Jesus is going to then possess characteristics of his father. And that's the nature of the virgin birth. And uh, the fact that Jesus possesses divine essence through the virgin birth. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I've got a couple more points I'd like to make, but I want to say a couple of things uh, regarding the deity of Christ that I believe need to be said that really aren't in the book. You know, Jesus said it's not enough just to believe in him. He said, Not everyone that calls, says to me, Lord, Lord, you're in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever does the will of my Father which is in heaven. John, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 22. Verse 22 says, Many will say unto me in that day, the judgment day, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name done many wonderful works, cast out demons? And he'll say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew Think about all those good things people do in the name of Jesus Christ. That preacher training schools, publications, right? Broadcast networks, all in the name of Jesus. All in the name of Jesus. But Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Think about that. Luke 4 and verse 46. You know, there were those in the time of Jesus, the chief rulers of the cities that believed on him. John chapter, 4, uh, John chapter 12 and verse 42. They believed that he was God in the flesh, but they would not confess him because of the Pharisees. Because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. We're going through a time in the brotherhood when there are men and, and, and brethren and schools and of preaching and publications and different types of work that once called on the name of the Lord and did the will of the Father, but are no longer. Friends and brethren, that's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. That people will acknowledge the deity of Christ but will not live in such a way as to prove the faith of their conviction. You know, the thing is, God drew a circle of fellowship. And there's an article in the publication from the Memphis congregation that has a article in there about I redrew my circle of fellowship. I don't draw my circle of fellowship. God drew my circle of fellowship. God drew it. And when somebody steps out of that circle, I can't fellowship them anymore. And they made that choice and not me. You know, we think about this doctrine of the deity of Christ. John said in his second epistle, in verse 9, 
if we transgress and abide not in the doctrine of Christ, well, that would certainly include the deity of Christ, wouldn't it? If we transgress and abide not in the doctrine of Christ, we have not God. But if we abide in the doctrine of Christ, we have both the Father and the Son. And we can't even accept or receive those that go beyond and teach another doctrine, or even those that bid them Godspeed. This is serious, serious study. There's serious consequences if we don't get it right. And friends and brethren, if we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that He is our Creator, and He's going to come back again, and He's going to judge us, and we're going to stand before Him in the judgments, and He's going to pass righteous judgment upon us, we better act like, we better live like Jesus is God. Because, friends and brethren, our future is in His hands. And we're going to be judged by the things that we've done in this life, whether good or bad. And I hope and pray that this lesson will help those that believe in the deity of Christ to have a stronger conviction, to live more faithfully to Him. And for those that may have questions and doubt, I hope that it will, will begin their study and help them reach conclusions in their mind regarding what they believe about Jesus Christ. We certainly appreciate your attention. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your freedom. And that was the lunch bell. Certainly an important topic for us to consider about the deity of Christ. You know, there's a whole uh, the majority of the world, as a matter of fact, do not even uh, acknowledge the historicity of Jesus. And those that may uh, acknowledge the historicity of Jesus do not admit to the deity of, of Jesus. And then there's another uh, large group of folks that would admit to both but by the practice of the doctrine that they uphold, they deny it uh, once again. Uh, then there are those of the Lord's Church that are doing the very same thing. If they are to uh, acknowledge the deity of Jesus, then they, uh, by, uh, by obligation, must do all those things that uh, he commands us to do, even in the area of fellowship. So to fail to do that is, by implication anyway, to deny the very essence, the very deity, the very lordship of Jesus himself. So uh, very timely subject. I appreciate that. Uh, of course, now is the the uh, lunch hour, and we certainly want to invite all of you to stay.